So we pick up the story in John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And now it's time for Buddy Thomas to enter the scene. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. All right, so are you you tracking with the scene? Jesus appeared to some of his disciples, but Thomas wasn't with them. So they they come to Thomas. They're excited, and they're proclaiming, we've seen the Lord. He's alive, Thomas. But Thomas, he's not so quick to get caught up in the excitement. He says, unless I see the wounds on his body for myself, I'm not going to believe. And I I think it's easy to read this narrative— and feel like Thomas is doing something wrong, right? Because everyone else is running and weeping and getting excitable, and we might get the impression that Thomas has this, like, negative, kind of downer attitude, but I'm not sure that that's the case. I think it's very important that we learn about Thomas's response because it's totally honest. It's real. And if everyone had the exact same reaction, to me at least, that would feel inauthentic. And this happens a lot in Christian circles, doesn't it? You know, whether we're singing songs or reading the Bible or listening to a sermon or doing some sort of service project together, sometimes we feel like there's a response we're all supposed to have. Have you ever felt that way? Like you're having a moment and all of a sudden you realize like, oh, I think I'm supposed to be crying right now. Or like, you know, are my hands supposed to be in the air? I think we're doing that now. Or, or everybody's nodding their head enthusiastically, like in agreement. This would be a good time to practice that. We could all nod our heads now with Curtis. Yes, we, we agree. Sometimes this happens, right? Where we feel like there's a response we're supposed to have. But Thomas has this very genuine, honest, reasonable response to the news that Jesus has risen from the dead. He's like, sorry guys, I have a hard time believing your story. I need a little evidence. And and let's not forget, when the women got to the tomb and couldn't find the body, they assumed it had been stolen because they found it hard to believe that he was risen from the dead as well until they encountered Jesus for themselves. But like Mary, when Thomas encountered the resurrected Jesus, he too believed. And then Jesus tells him, he says, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. And many people have read this kind of like a low-key rebuke from Jesus. You know, maybe you picture Jesus with this kind of smug look like, yeah, way to go, Thomas. You believe because you see me, but it's the people who believe me without seeing me. Those are the ones who have like legit meaningful faith. But I don't think that's the case. If that was the case, then Jesus isn't only chastising Thomas. He would have to be also chastising Mary Magdalene and all the other disciples in the narrative, because they only believed after they saw Jesus for themselves. 
So I don't think Jesus is trying to discredit Thomas's faith at all. But he is pointing to the reality that there will be people who do believe in Jesus even though they didn't have the opportunity to encounter Jesus directly in the flesh. And the reason that those people one day will believe is because of the honest testimony of people like Thomas. You see, Thomas's hesitation, his skepticism, his doubt is going to add to the honest account of the way Jesus appeared when he rose from the dead. But if you are the kind of person who is skeptical, doubtful, hesitant, the story of Thomas assures us it is okay to have doubts. Because in the end, despite his doubts, Thomas actually recognizes Jesus in a way that was totally unique up until that point. See, when, when he recognizes Jesus, he declares, my Lord and my God. He recognizes his master, his rabbi, and he recognizes him as God. And did you know that Thomas is the very first person in John's gospel who speaks this directly to Jesus, declaring, I believe you are God. And this is a theme that runs throughout John's book. Who will recognize Jesus? Who will believe him and accept him? He wants us to grasp the truth about Jesus' identity, and he wants us to see that he is God. And you can feel the stirring throughout the book as various people encounter Jesus and have all kinds of responses. And in the end, it is not the most excitable follower who makes this bold proclamation. It's not one of Jesus' closest friends. It's the one who's hesitant, who's unsure, who's skeptical, who ultimately declares, my Lord and my God. Athanasius is one of the early church leaders, and he says this. He says, since the Savior's raising the body, no longer is death fearsome, but all believers in Christ tread on it as nothing. For they really know that when they die, they are not destroyed, but both live and become incorruptible through the resurrection. No longer is death fearsome. Just as Christ's body was raised, so too shall we be raised with him. But the resurrection of Jesus' physical body is also a reminder that we do not just have our sights set on some sort of future disembodied reality. His glorified physical body is a sign that heaven and earth are being brought together. Beth Felker Jones says it this way, Right now, the embodied life is good and beloved and purposeful, but it is also life pressed down by the weight of sin. Embodied life now is vulnerable and mortal. We stand in need of change and we long for transformation, to be freed from the effects of sin and the domination of death. The difference between present and future is not a difference between materiality and spirituality. The difference is between bodies ruled by sin and death and bodies freed from the power of sin and death through the Holy Spirit. So while we long for our future destiny when we will participate in the resurrection, we have the opportunity here and now to practice the resurrection life, to proclaim to the world who Jesus is and what he's done. And we do this together in our own bodies. It says this in 1 Corinthians 12, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. That's what church is. Together, our lives and our testimony declares to the world the life that we have found in Jesus. We become the place where others can encounter the hope of our resurrected Lord. 